urogyny and pelvic organ prolapse today we'll be covering only the urogyny so the guideline starts with assessing the patient of course the first thing to be done to any any patient that comes to us and that involves history taking so the history should consist of the symptoms of the patient and it should be consisting of the most relevant things like whether she has any associated bleeding or burning during maturation or any prolapse along with urinary incontinence we have to find out what type of urinary incontinence it can be if she rushes to the toilet then it, it may seem something like overactive bladder if she coughs and then she leaks on cough it looks more like stress urinary incontinence we need to find out whether it is uh, only overactive bladder or only stress urinary or genuine stress urinary incontinence or it's it's a mixed type wherein both the things happen and which one is the more predominant symptoms in case of a mixed urinary incontinence the history should also involve the past obstetric history specifically any history of operative delivery because that may cause weakening of the muscles also it should involve the medical history like any muscle weakening disorders in the family or herself surgical history any uh, and the other history goes the same as that for the other modules also remember to do the physical examination for the patient it should involve the general examination along with that there should be the vaginal examination too and there should be the digital smell of the pelvic floor muscles in cases specifically of stress urinary incontinence also try to see if there is any visible incontinence of urine on when the patient coughs while doing examination now next it tells that the first thing and the, the most important and the first thing to be done is urine dipstick testing and here you will be testing for blood glucose leukocytes proteins nitrites everything the next step is if the dipstick is positive or the patient is symptomatic go for culture and give antibiotics and i've kind of made it a summary type of thing so that you remember the step by step uh, the thing step by step and this can be a source of revision just read the guideline first and do not consider this session as an alternative to reading the nice guidance the guidance tells that if the patient is symptomatic then do not wait for the culture report to come to start antibiotics right we need to give antibiotics after taking the culture report and so that the patient feels better by the time this antibiotics work uh, and the culture report comes right also the guideline tells that whenever the culture report is positive start the antibiotics if the patient is asymptomatic and and uh, then there is no hurry of starting the antibiotics of course right assess the residual urine that's the next step when it is to be done it is to be done specifically in cases of recurrent utis 
or voiding problems. It can be done by two methods. One is bladder scan, one is catheterization. Bladder scan is considered better because it's non-invasive, of course, to assess the residual urine. The next thing to be done is to assess the quality of life. There are questionnaires and there is a bladder diary that needs to be maintained. It should be involving three days of life, which should involve the leisure days, also the days of working to find out how the patient reacts on the different days and how um, is the incontinence. The patient has to maintain a diary wherein the patient has to write in all the fluid intake and outputs like coffee, tea, water, whatever the juice, whatever the patient is taking, how much amount she is taking. And also she has to write whether there was any incontinence on that day. And if yes then after how much time after eating so she has to write yes or no whether there was incontinence or day not and yes how many times it was right also it tells about referring to the specialist services if there are associated symptoms now remember about the urodynamics. Urodynamics is not something that can be done by a general physician. So you need a specialist there. Also remember, urodynamics involves uroflometry, systometry, and it needs to be done by the specialist of urogynecology. So remember that urodynamics, that means the, the systometry and the uroflometry it should be done only when it is required and it cannot it, it should not be done or it does not require in cases of genuine stress urinary incontinence wherein the patient only has a complaint of stress urinary incontinence doesn't have any other related symptoms after undertaking a detailed clinical history and examination performed multi-channel filling or voiding systematically before surgery for stress urinary incontinence in women who have any of the following urge predominant mixed urinary incontinence so you have to go for urodynamics or go for a test if the patient has any signs of mixed urinary incontinence the incontinence in which the type is unclear the symptoms suggestive of voiding dysfunction, anterior or apical prolapse, and a history of previous surgery for stress urinary incontinence. Okay. This is because the women are really distressed when they have this problem and they come generally when the symptoms have been for, loops for quite some long period. Now, there are some non surgical management methods of urinary incontinence. These methods apply to all the types of incontinences. The lifestyle measures needs to be told to every patient, like reducing the body mass index, 
reducing the coffee, stopping on smoking, maintaining the fluid. So if she is taking too many, we need to tell that she should take a little less than that. If she's taking very less, then she has then she may have more chances of having urinary tract infections, which may lead to more incontinence. Then we have to tell her to maintain the fluids. Remember, there is another line about desmopressin, which is a case in uh, which is the tablet that needs to be taken up in cases of nocturia. Well, guys, uh, nocturia is defined as any time the patient needs or has an urge or gets up it at night. More than once to pass urine. And in such cases, desmopressin should be used. Caution is, is required specifically in cases of cystic fibrosis, when the patients are more than 65 years, and in cases of cardiovascular disease, right? Also, there's this new thing in the guideline, which is different from the previous one about the absorbed containment pads, urinals, toileting aids. They have said that it shouldn't be used routinely. Also, it should be used only as a coping method along with the main treatment or in patients who are using it for a very long time, the treatment for the very long time. It, it has told about the reviewing of these products yearly assess ulcers incontinence how it is helping incontinence comorbidities and the efficacy of this product to help cope the urinary incontinence about the overactive bladder what exactly is overactive bladder? Overactive bladder is when the patient has the feeling of passing urine when the bladder is not full. And the patient has to rush to the toilet. Otherwise, the patient may wet herself or she just has that sensation of rushing to the toilet it is because the urine that is filling the bladder is actually making the the detrusor muscle of the bladder overactive and that is causing that reaction of rushing to the toilet now the first thing that you have to remember is to reduce all the irritants like coffee even alcohol Reducing the body mass index is very much useful here. But that is more useful in stress urinary incontinence. Also, reducing the smoking will reduce the irritation of detrusor. And for smoking, this they do not say reducing, it's stopping smoking. About the bladder training, what is bladder training? Bladder training is when they ask the patient to hold the urine for, for some time and then pass it and increase the time as uh, she progresses. So that bladder training is, done, is to be given for six weeks. That's the next step. I have written it specifically in that way so that this will be really useful in your EMQs because this is exactly the steps that are written and that should be followed while doing the management of urogyne patients. Now, the third thing is about the bladder training plus anticholinergic medicines. So, you have to remember that whenever in the EMQ, if you have that the bladder training is done for six months and now what next and it, it's written 
anticholinergic medicine and bladder training plus anticholinergic medicine remember you have to continue the bladder training okay so the the second one should be the option now here any medicine should be started at low dose and low cost specifically the anticholinergic because it has got too many side effects the side effects are dry mouth constipation heartburn cognitive problems now this anticholinergic medicines they are oxybutynin darifenacin tolterotin they are considered to be useful remember about oxytocin it shouldn't be given the immediate release do not give in women with who are older because it may cause cognitive problems in those patients so do not give this anticholinergics in patients who have got muscle weakness problems or problems related to acetylcholine like toxic megacolon myasthenia and dravis right which may aggravate the problems for them now about this medicine it said that they should be reviewed and remember it takes 4 weeks for this anticholinergic medicines to act so they should be reviewed in 4 weeks if the patient has started having side effects that means the medicine is working if there is no or some optimal improvement or intolerable adverse effect change the dose or try an alternative medicine for overactive bladder offer a review in primary care to women who remain on long term medicine for overactive bladder or urinary incontinence every 12 months if they are is for and the practice of the bladder so for that she may change to the different dose or increase in the uh, the re reduction in the dose of the medicine that was already given or you may change the tablet or the medicine at that time right now next comes the may era pregnant which is a beta 3 agonist it has got less side effect as compared to the anticholinergics and though there is nothing much mention in the guideline they may ask about this myth about that less side effect but it it does cause some side effects like tachycardia urinary tract infections hypertension eyelid edema these are mentioned in the strategy and also in the tog of overactive refractory overactive bladder management now this mira pregron is to be given in patients who cannot tolerate the anticholinergics of course and the next step comes about the urodynamics we have seen about urodynamics that it needs to be done only after the first treatment the first hand treatment is given and now you need an intervention so it should only be given before the surgery or before the intervention and once it is done the multidisciplinary team should be involved 
Now, there are two types of cares that the page, the guideline has mentioned, and this is very new thing. It tells about the local multi multidisciplinary team and the regional multidisciplinary team, and starts with the invasive treatment. The invasive treatment involves the botulinum toxin A. Remember, it is A. They may confuse you by giving B many a times. The dose has been changed. It was 200 initially. In now, it is 100 units initially. So this is a star point. Review in 12 weeks, that means three months. What do they do with botulinum toxin? It acts presynaptically by the SNAP25. Also, it decreases the release of other excitatory neurotransmitters and axonal expression of proteins. The sensory afferent pathway is also affected. This toxin generally persists for around three to six months. And it should be started at a very low dose of 100 units because it may increase the chance of urinary retention if given at higher doses. But if you find that the patient comes back within six months and says that the incontinence has come up, you need to increase the dose to 200. The side effects of botulinum toxin involves intermittent self catheterization and urinary tract infections of injection which will cause the relaxation of the bladder and initially the patient needs to be taught about the intermittent catheterization by herself it should be given only in those patients who are willing to do intermittent catheterization because that is the thing that the patient will most of the times have complications of and because of that catheterizations and also because of the procedure the patients and also because of the too much of retention of urine the patients are in more at risk of having urine tract infections what they do is while doing the flexible cystoscopy in the opd with local anesthesia they inject the botulinum toxin on the different sides of the bladder from inside right and then ask the patient to find out if the patient has got has any retention of urine and remember and she should be already by that time trained for intermittent catheterization by the specific nurse now remember there is a specific point given in the talk about the amino glycoside antibiotics and remember to avoid them whenever you are giving the botulinum, especially in cases of general anesthesia. Now, the next one is about the percutaneous sacral nerve stimulation. It can be local or regional multidisciplinarity that may take up the chance or that may take up the treatment by going for. The sacral nerve stimulation there are two types one is autonomic and one is somatic uh, so it it actually the the sacral nerve stimulation acts on both the autonomic and the somatic nerves it acts on the afferent pathway of the spinal cord to influence the bladder Here, what we do is we take a small skin incision under LA, that means local anesthesia, a few inches above the coccyx, 
at S3 foramen near the midline and there a temporary electrode is inserted. It is seen whether the levator ani is stimulated and a plantar to flexion happens. The perineal stimulation occurs. That means the electrode is working. It is giving signals appropriately and the treatment is successful. But like other treatments, this too has some side effects of failure, going for a surgery. Long-term commitment is required in these, in these patients who go for the sacral nerve stimulation. The success rate, long-term success rate is around 65% in these patients. And, but reoperation may be required in around one-third of these patients. Remember, do not use any kind of nerve stimulation devices in patients who have got pacemakers. is augmentation cystoplasty the the thing that we take up at the last in any patient augmentation cystoplasty involves removing the part of the gut specifically the ileum and attaching it to the bladder so that the bladder relaxes but it has complications counseling of the women carrier it should include the serious complications mucus in the blushes you this with augmentation cystoplasty of malignancy affected Remember about this malignancy risk. It's really important. They keep on asking this thing every now and then and provide the lifelong follow up for these patients. It's, it's, it's uh, not its own. It's actually coming from the gut. So it tends <coughs> to cause a lot of problems, specifically the ileum part. And there is a chance that continuous irritation of urine to the lining of ileum may cause increase the risk of malignancy, right? The last thing to be taken up is urinary diversion. What happens is when nothing works and the patient is chronically bedridden or the patient has had this problem for a very long time, this is the method that is considered to be the last source, the last treatment. It requires a lot of expertise. But remember, these patients require lifelong follow-up too. Now, what to do when a patient has got stress urinary incontinence? Either genuine or it is the predominant symptom in cases of mixed urinary incontinence. The pelvic floor muscle exercises are important. They are given for three months as the first line in cases of stress urinary incontinence, of course, after doing the first part of the chart that we have seen. It is, they are asked to hold the, the wind or they are asked to, to do the exercise in that way. Do it around eight contractions, three times a day, okay? The multidisciplinary team is involved. Remember? Stress incontinence, the first thing that we should be thinking.
thinking of is going for a pulpo suspension because it has around 90% of the success rate. Though there are many things that we should be looking for because it is an operation. If the patient has to deal with all the side effects or the, and the complications associated with that. But for now, that is considered the safest. Autologous rectus facial sling can also, also be considered. Now remember about this mesh thing. It's it's very controversial and something that can be asked. The retropubic mid urethral mesh sling procedures can be used, but they were banned in between because of the too many complications associated with mesh. So they have come up with doing this surgery only accepting an eye on the mesh all the time. The bottom up method is used. Type 1 macroporous mesh is used. It should be colored so that we can differentiate and it should be reviewed in six months. Complete removal may not be possible. The patient should be told about all the complications that can occur with mesh and the extrusion and irritation are the things that come up very commonly with mesh and can cause problems for the women. For women who have had retropubic mid urethral mesh sling surgery, the follow up appointment should include the vaginal examination to check for the exposure or extrusion of the mesh sling. The next one is the intramural bulking agent. Give the women written information about the bulking agent, including its name manufacturer date of injection injection surgeon's name contact details silicon dextran polymer zirconium beads these are the bulking agents that are used silicon dextran polymer zirconium beads now this uh, giving the details of the patient and the material is also goes with mesh and it's really important there whatever complications that arises with mesh are to be reported to mhra and mesh is uh, something that you have to remember the manufacturer date the date of doing the procedure who has done it what type of uh, mesh was used everything needs to be given also with the mesh the last uh, thing that you should be looking for is the artificial urinary sphincter wherein this will reduce the risk of stress and incontinence in patients who have previous failed surgeries, right? Stress and incontinence patients generally have a loss of food at the base of the bladder and that causes the incontinence whenever the pressure in the tummy and the, or the abdomen increases, right? Sometimes there can be a problem with the sphincter itself and you need to find out what exactly is the problem is the problem with the support of the base of the bladder the floor muscle offer a follow-up appointment within six months to all the women who have had surgical procedure to treat the stress urinary incontinence go for duloxetin but do not consider it as a first line treatment for women with predominant stress urinary incontinence and do not routinely offer duloxetine as a second line treatment for women with stress urinary incontinence although it may be offered as a second line therapy if women prefer pharmacological to the surgical treatment or are not suitable for surgical treatment if duloxetine is prescribed she should be told about the side effects which can come up very uh, frequently with duloxetin right so these are the different ways of tackling with stress urinary incontinence the guideline is a very new thing that is 
tells about how the local and the regional multidisciplinary units work and who they involve. Now, they have said that the local multidisciplinary teams for women with primary stress pro proposed treatment for all women offered invasive treat procedures for primary stress urinary incontinence, overactive bladder, or primary prolapse. They should review the proposed management for women with primary stress urinary incontinence, overactive bladder, or primary prolapse if input from the wider range of. Of health care professionals is needed and work within an established clinical network that has access to the regional MGT. They should involve two consultants, a pelvic floor specialist physiotherapist and also include a member of care of the elder team about the regional multidisciplinary team it deals with the complex pelvic floor dysfunction and much related problems it should review the proposed treatment if they are there are repeated continent surgeries they are having repeat same site prolapse surgeries their preferred treatment option is not available in referring hospital they have coexisting bowel problems that that may need additional colorectal intervention the regional multidisciplinary teams and they will be the ones who will be taking up these patients. Now, these teams should have already access to psych counseling, chronic pain management, bowel symptom management, and neurology. The regional multidisciplinary team should involve a subspecialist in urogyny, a urologist with expertise in female urology, specialist with in floor imaging. A surgeon with expertise in pelvic floor problems, a pain specialist with expertise in managing the pelvic pain, and may also include we cannot assure whether they are going to ask people from regional team and the local team or not. But because that's a new thing that's there in the guideline, try and remember the members too. I hope this summary was useful. I did not involve the Eurodynamics in this session because that's a completely different chapter and will require a different session. So uh, this is only the revision of the NICE guideline and I'll come up with the pelvic floor uh, prolapse, uh, the, uh, the pelvic organ prolapse also uh, in the next session so that we can finish the whole guideline. Hope this has helped you. I've tried to involve the points that comes from the talks and also from the strategy and Try to remember to read strategy. It's, it's a very, very important source. It's called as e-learning for trainees now. And it's, it's a really important source because there's nothing that is given in any of the talks or the guidelines apart uh, from the e-learning. Thank you, guys.